This program is brought to you by Emory University. Uh, so before we get to our very exciting and important uh, plenary lunch today uh, on the politics of black, transgender, and genderqueer justice, I have a few logistical items to go through, so please bear with me. There is a gender-neutral restroom that is located to the right if you walk out of this ballroom um, near the registration table. Um, and then other, that restroom and other restrooms are, uh, all of the other restrooms that are on this floor are in your conference center map. So look for that if you're looking for a restroom. Breakout sessions today end at 420, and then you'll have a break to have dinner on, on your own. And then uh, we really encourage you to join us for an evening of spoken word poetry on Emory's campus at the Harlan Cinema and that's at 7.30 p.m. Uh, I know it's raining outside, but you basically get door-to-door -door service because we have shuttles, so don't worry. Um, the shuttles will be picking up from the main lobby, right outside the main lobby of the conference center between 6.30 and they'll run until 7.15. The program starts at 7.30. And I'm really telling you, you don't wanna miss this. You're gonna be really, really sad if you don't go because we have Red Summer, yes, we have Jericho Brown, and we have Stacey Ann Chin. So it's gonna be amazing, and you really wanna be there. Now tomorrow, uh, don't stay out too late because breakout sessions start at 8.30 in the morning. And uh, sorry about that. Um, but we have a full day, we have a packed day. Um, and then uh, for lunch tomorrow, we're gonna be having small uh, round table discussion groups. So if you'll look on your table right now, you'll see a list of all those discussion groups and who's moderating them. They're very exciting. Um, and the purpose of these round table discussions is to give you an opportunity to engage with some of the issues brought up during the conference in a small group setting. So it's, it's discussion based, there's no lecture, no, pa no papers. And the discussions, as you can see from the list, are led by conference presenters and other experts in these areas. If you have not signed up, sign up after lunch at the registration table, which is you know, basically across from this ballroom. Um, it's on a first come, first serve basis, and seating is limited. Um, it's, for most of them, it's 10 spots around the table. So if you don't sign up now, you might not get the discussion that you want. Directly after the last breakout session tomorrow, please join Leslie and myself for a drink because we'll definitely be having one. Um, as well as uh, some lovely food at our closing reception, which is from 4 to 7 p.m. And that is in the Silver Bell Pavilion, Pavilion um, which is basically if you go upstairs back to the lobby and go to the other side of the, of the hotel, it's over that way. And there are signs that will point you in that direction. Lastly, I want to thank again all of our sponsors who are listed in your program, and we, we talked about um, many of them last night, as well as all of the volunteers uh, and the wonderful um, Emory Conference Center staff who've been so lovely. If we could give all of them a hand. They've been fantastic. And I also want to particularly point out three incredible women who um, have been doing all the kind of behind the scenes work, and I would like for them to stand. Uh, Tiffany Del Valle and Chanel Kraft from the Center for Women, they're in the back. And then Shannon Palma over here with the walkie talkie um, in the front. Um, I can tell you that without these three women, we would all be wandering around in the halls, we would not have food, we would not know what to do. Um, they have been really uh, the backbone of this uh, endeavor. So when you see them, thank them. Um, and now I'm gonna turn it over to Leslie. That's right.
Hi, good afternoon. I'm really excited about this session. And it gives me great pleasure in particular to introduce our moderator for today's session, E. Patrick Johnson. Hey, that's right. So I probably don't need to say much more than that, but I want to remind you of how fabulous he truly is. Patrick is Carlos Montezuma Professor of Performance Studies and African American Studies at Northwestern University. The main body of his scholarship makes critical interventions into our understanding of sexual and gender diversity in African American LGBT communities through the use of ethnographies, which he then has published, but as many of you know, he has also translated into soul-stirring performances. His Sweet Tea, Black Gay Men of the South and Oral History was published in 2008 by UNC <coughs> Press. And out of that work, he has created a full play as well as a shorter hour-long production that invites us to share Sweet Tea with the men he has spent time with and brings us into the lives of his interviewees. He is currently completing interviews for Honey Pot, Women Loving Women in the South. And he has begun workshopping those interviews as performances as well. I will say that I've known of Patrick's work for a long time, but this year I had the particular pleasure of witnessing his interview of my partner, Pam Zammy Hall. It was an incredibly intimate and spiritual experience for us. Patrick's ability to create a sacred space between himself and his subject is truly profound. And I had a similar spiritual experience this week, which I very much needed, when I joined uh, Patrick and about 50 or 60 um, young people um, and a few administrators, a few old heads, <laughs> um, well, where he performed selections from Sweet Tea at Morehouse College here in Atlanta for the first time. Patrick performed, yeah. Patrick performed for an hour, but the talk back, which he always includes with his performances, lasted 90 minutes, and it just ranged the gamut um, of questions and answers and discussion, and it was wonderful. I was so glad I made time for that performance this, um, this week, which truly fed me and reminded me of why I'm doing the work of this conference. I, I, I will turn to the rest of our panel in a second, but Patrick plans to come back to Atlanta this year and perform the full version of Sweet Tea, and I encourage all of you to invite him to your communities or keep track of when he will appear near you. <laughs> and now I'll turn the rest of our lunch over to E. Patrick Johnson. Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to first thank the conference organizers for creating this space for us to commune and fellowship with one another about these very important topics and because of the symbolism of it being in the South. I am a Southerner. Hey. And we're not sexually slow, as some would have it. There's a lot of carrying on down here. And so it's, uh, it's a great honor to, to be here before you. And it's also a particular honor to be the moderator of this plenary panel on the politics of black transgender and genderqueer justice as a part of the Who's Beloved Community Conference. And so I'm going to introduce our esteemed panelists uh, this afternoon. Uh, there are longer bios of each of them in your program, so I'll do an abbreviated form uh, of introduction. And then I have a set of questions that I will engage uh, our entire panelists with. Uh, they have um, graciously uh, been in touch with me beforehand, and so I think it's going to be a very rich uh, and productive conversation. To my very far right, we have Kalar Bradas, who is Senior Public Policy Counsel of the Transgender Civil Rights Project for the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force. Bradas has enjoyed a prolific career as an activist, writer, lawyer, professor, lobbyist, and public speaker. As an attorney, Bradas practiced with a focus on LGBT law, particularly transgender rights. He currently serves as faculty at Lincoln University in Missouri. C. 
seated next to him is Tracy McDaniel, who I, when I walked into the room last night at dinner, um, there was just this glow on the other side. She just brings this presence into the room and is so gracious and it's so wonderful to meet her. Uh, Tracy is the CEO and founder of Juxtapose Center for Transformation Incorporated here in Atlanta. Her life and mission provides her with the insight to advocate for all transgender and gender nonconforming people. She is the author of Transitions, Memoirs of a Transsexual Woman. Next is Holiday Simmons. Holiday is Community Education and Advocacy Director of the Southern Regional Office of Lambda Legal. With a background in social work, education, and performing arts and activism, Simmons has worked with youth in foster care, taught GED, managed education initiatives, and facilitated numerous creative writing and spoken word workshops with groups of youth LGBT people, women, and Africana and Latina, Latino communities, both in the United States and abroad. And finally, who we just have, I understand, for just two hours, <laughs> because she has to get back to DC, is Ashley Davis, who is Special Assistant to the Assistant Secretary for Civil Rights at the Department of Agriculture. Before joining USDA, Davis served in the White House as a Staff Assistant to the Special Assistant to the President for Presidential Personnel. In this role, she assisted with the personnel decisions and processes for energy and environment federal agencies, including five cabinet level agencies and two executive offices of the president. I thought I would begin this conversation uh, with asking the panelists about a definition, and that definition is of justice. So my question to each of you, and you can answer it in your own way, how does each of you define justice for black transgender and gender queer individuals? Well, it's funny you start with me because I'm a lawyer, <laughs> and <laughs> lawyers typically don't believe in justice. <clears throat> we work in the justice system, but what we generally tell you is you come to us for justice, and justice is an elusive concept, okay? Uh, you know, we ha see the statue of justice and, and she's the lady justice and she's blind, but we actually know that people administer justice, right? And people aren't generally blind while they administer justice, which is the point I'm making here. So while we see that, it trickles to trans people. So the idea of justice for trans people, and I'm not sure how your question or framing of your question, but uh, if you could clarify for me, I guess, because I start with it from that framework. That's what I'm asking. Okay, so I, I don't see there's a justice for anybody. Okay, because justice isn't blind. The reality of it is. But, so I would see that we're all looking for fairness and that everybody deserves certain basic essential things in life. Uh, and while we know that on this continent, as many continents, that transgender people have not gotten the fair end of the stick. And so we generally see justice as some sort of fairness in that sense. And so we all are here fighting for, or at least on this panel, and generally I think the consensus is fighting for some sort of fairness so that we have economic justice, we have social justice in the sense that we're not abused in the penal system, that we're off the streets, that we have access to health care and those basic essential things that we don't generally have access to. There are only a few of us that do, and even those that appear to, 
which are the, us on the panel, and notice I say appear to have access to those, don't generally have access to those, that we have to fight for those every day. And when you hear me speak, I'll say that coming out every day is like wearing a suit of armor as a trans person, if you're out and proud as a trans person, that we have to get up every day and suit up and come out ready for battle. So that's my sense of what justice looks like for a trans person. First off, I'd, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting us and having this very important conversation here this afternoon. Um, my um, perception of justice is being treated fairly um, when you go to the court system. Unfortunately, we've heard the stories about transgender, gender non-conforming people defending themselves um, against crowds of transphobic people. And then when they turn around and, and fight back, they're the ones that are sentenced to jail and to prisons in, in most cases. So I think that justice is treating transgender and gender non-conforming people fairly, not based on our gender identity, but based on our humanity. So um, hopefully uh, that one day in the future we, we, we won't have to you know, um, talk about transgender people being treated unfairly by the court system. Um, very grateful to be in this space and to uh, have one example of justice be that this panel is, um, is the lunchtime panel is around trans issues and I think centering trans people and trans issues is one example of justice and on that same tip, um, you know, I'm all about expanding our resources and our rights and um, trans people being more a part of inclusive spaces, uh, both within LG LGB spaces as well as mainstream societies, but more than just inclusion and being centered. Um, I'm about trans people. I think trans justice for me looks like um, reshaping the entire paradigm and trans people being at the forefront of um, reshaping all of these uh, systems that we have um, and not just about sort of getting our place in Congress and getting our place at a workplace. Um, and so um, with that, I would actually like to read a little poem because at a conference about black folks and queer people, uh, I need a little bit more art. <laughs> and um, so this is, uh, it's taken from uh, the words by this uh, new ballroom song called I'm a Read uh, by Zebra Cats. Um, and it's about what I mean by centering trans people is not just looking at trans people as uh, survivors, but also as uh, sort of anointed. And uh, like we have secrets, like we know things. Um, and so uh, well, we have things to teach our, our cis uh, brothers and sisters um, beyond just sort of wanting to be included in y'all spaces. Um, that's no shade, just like. <laughs> I'ma read, I'ma read, I'ma read. I'ma take that on to college. I'ma give that on some knowledge. I'ma read, I'ma read, I'ma read. The, yes, the library is open because we know things, feel things, see things, intuit things. We knew that the princess dress we got for our birthday was just a little too dressy. <laughs> we knew that the race car we got when we turned five was just a little too racy. We know things, feel things far beyond many. Before most, we, we perform most of what we should, plastering ourselves with ifs and onlys and woods, realities hard like wood, dreams soft like trees. We praise Allah, the Torah, dance around a fire and even get on our knees, pleading and fleeting another internal soul beating. Still we know things. We knew that the bustier gone sports bra chopped or to transform the race car into a jewelry box or to make them both into an art project hot. We knew that this would be just the beginning of our safety's time clock. A tick towards our true selves, a talk towards worry, ridicule, arrest, rape, wriggling and writhing on a timeline deemed worthlessness, but not you worry, worry you not, because we know things. We knew that the destination can be an incessant it. We know that the destination can be an incessant itch, but it is the journey that makes us rich. We know that when we trans transcend our gender in order to decode our core, 
that we are living our purpose to be timekeepers and shapeshifters, conduits between men and women, masculine and feminine. We are synonym for God. For God is change and truth is glory. So that even when our stories turn tragic, we snatched of our magic. We, in our courage to behold, we know that we have created change in our courage to behold and our wisdom to listen to that inner voice and our hope for humanity. Yes, we know things so that when our stories go on, our memories move on, our legacies live on, even when our physical structures are long gone. So I'ma read, I'ma read, I'ma read, I'ma read, I'ma take y'all to college, I'ma give y'all some knowledge. Get your library card, because we know things. Fret not, regret not, forget you not. Honey child, I'm trying to told you that we know things. Yeah. Never sit next to Holiday. <laughs> <laughs> Go before Holiday, not after. Good afternoon, everyone. It's, a, it's an absolute pleasure, as, as my colleagues and fellow, fellow panelists have said. Um, sorry it's just two hours, but um, it's certainly going to be hopefully a blessed hour or two hours. It feels that way. Um, I couldn't say anything uh, different than my panelists have said, uh, but I do want to echo a little bit and first and foremost say that uh, if I don't say this, my boss would be mad at me because he was pretty ticked that he couldn't be here. I think he... We told Ms. Harris, he'll be here, he'll be here, uh, and then his schedule got pulled away. But this is the type of opportunity, the type of space that uh, my boss, Dr. Leonard, loves and appreciates uh, because he sees uh, the power, the, the spirit that, that, quite frankly, can move this country that comes from small gathering spaces just like this. Um, I love that we talked about the South in the beginning because I'm a, I'm a Southerner too, uh, and I don't think we moved that slow at all. We moved just right. Well. Um, but to, uh, to the point uh, in question, the justice definition naturally lends itself to the idea of fairness. I think naturally lends itself also to thinking about lady justice, as Kyla brought up um, so eloquently, because quite frankly, that's our idea, is that uh, when decisions, when policies are made, they aren't made with any specific being in, in mind, but rather they're made with the idea of that general good, that how would we want to be treated when we make that decision, whether we know it's going to affect us or not. And that's how I think about justice. I think also about that veil of ignorance that I learned, I think probably when I was like 19, 20, sitting in, in the University of Pittsburgh as an undergrad. But I remember my philosophy teaching, teacher speaking to me about making decisions on the other side uh, with a blind knowledge as to whether or not that decision was going to affect you or your brother or your sister or some random stranger. I think that's how we have to think about justice as it comes within the transgender scope. Uh, people think about uh, trans people as if uh, they are something that you see in the zoo rather than the fact that they are their brothers and sisters that sit alongside them, that bleed the same way they bleed. Um, and, and to that mind, we talk about inclusion and some folks get a little itchy about the idea of inclusion because it, it does kind of bring up these connotative ideas. But in the same space, I'm actually more itchy about the idea of tolerance and, and that idea of cultural sensitivity. Those words really make me feel less comfortable than the idea of inclusion. Mm -hmm. Because to me, your cultural sensitivity, your idea of inclusion, uh, or rather, your idea of just including someone just for a moment can wear away. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that we have to come to the table, that the greatest moment of my life was when I got the opportunity to sit around that table in the White House and make the same type of valued inputs as those uh, that didn't quite look like me or were gender conforming. Because every time we sit at that table, and we don't just sit there to be counted, but we sit there to count. Um, we make a splash, a ripple, and we create this space where folks can walk in this justice Latin space and street. Um, and so I hope I've answered the point. I may have just started preaching, but I hope. Um, <laughs> well, I you in the South, we can do that. I, yeah, that's true, that's true. <laughs> well, as long as well, you well, get well, one well, more well, amen. Well. All right. Uh, <laughs> but it, absolutely, um, very, very much in short, that justice idea is something that we are, quite frankly, going to be running towards way past our lifetimes. It'd be easy to think that we're going to pass away from this earth and justice will be there. Um, but that's not how justice works. I mean, I think Kyler said it perfectly. If you believe that justice is something that just is easily attained and just out there on the shelf, then you're just completely delusional because that's not how justice works at all. But it is attainable in a certain form. So thank you. So. 
some of you have, have spoken um, to this a little bit, but I want to go a little further in depth, and that is, for some, the T in the mantra LGBT um, has been a silent one, uh, since transgender issues have not always been at the forefront of the larger LGBT movement. And it's really significant, I think, that at a conference such as this, that there is a featured plenary um, with uh, the issue of transgender being at the forefront. But we know that that has not always been the case in our community, not just the black community, but within the LGBT community. So speaking from your own perspective, how do you account for this historical silence? And how has each of your organizations engaged trans rights in relation to or separate from LGB rights? Whoever wants to start can. All right, I'll be glad to start. Um, it has not been at the beginning. And um, I don't like to talk about age. It's a little sensitive to me these days. Um, you can laugh at that. That was a little joke. Um, but if you can count, uh, and you, uh, at any rate, we'll, we'll let that go, Kyler. Uh, but, but I'll say this, been, having been around the movement for a minute, the T has been silent for a long time. And for somebody that's been out here chopping trees for a long time to make the tea not silent, as I see some of my brothers and sisters and gender non-conforming people that also have been, it's been disheartening uh, to see that uh, and to be spurned by my L, G, and B brothers and sisters, particularly in the black community. Uh, when I go to do black prides and I walk into a room to do a training and they think I'm a cute gay man and they're like all up in it. And then I disclose as a trans man and they run out of the room. So I want to first put that lesson to my black brothers and sisters to stop. I'm here to say stop because Kyler plays for real. And we need to be real. Because why do we do that? And I'll leave you to answer that for yourself. We need to be a cohesive community as a black community. And when did that stop? Moving on from that point, uh, the greater community has left the T behind. And why is that also? Uh, we are discriminated against not because we're gay or lesbian, because we don't conform to some gender norm or stereotype. Nobody knows who you're sleeping with at night unless you tell them or unless you walk out in public and display it. And I'm not uh, advocating that you be invisible with who you love. But my point is, is that there's an intersection, an intersectionality between trans and LGB folk and for us to be fooled by that. And my work doing legislative work is they didn't know any different mm -hmm. until we educated them. And once we educated them, then they knew a difference. Okay, but they just, we were all in the same boat rowing together as far as they knew, okay? So for us to be fooled and think that we can put trans people over there and we're gonna get something without uh, as long as we distance ourselves from the people with the, as the lepers and put them over there is just fooling ourselves. We're all human beings as somebody else on this panel uh, just indicated. So uh, let me get back to the point because I'm, I'm a little heated by that we do that to other human beings uh, as human beings that are oppressed on many levels due to our race, due to our class, and due to our sexualities and genders. Let's stop the madness. Now, I happen to, and, and, and you did a great job introducing me, and I'm not an egomaniac, but I do want to mention a group that I started called the Trans People of Color Coalition, because also in this way, trans people of color uh, kind of got left out, which is why I created that group, because we weren't in the mix, okay? So our voices needed to be lifted and raised because we've been doing a yeoman's work for many, many years and decades. 
okay? And we've been in our people of color communities and we've been accepted for years and we've been untitled and unnamed and we've been here right with you in the churches and doing the work and cooking and right along and tidying and doing everything. And so that needs to be recognized. Trans people are not new. So let's get with the program, okay? When I came out to my own mother, God rest her soul, and I just lost her a little less than six months ago, and I was very close to both of my parents who uh, I loved dearly and they loved me dearly, and so that's a blessing that I had and still have. Uh, I had to remind her of uh, Elder Kassan who wore spats and wife sat in the front row when she came and was allowed to preach in the Baptist pool pit with pants on when I came out. I said, what was up with Elder Kassan, mother? So that she got the connect. So I know I'm going a little long, and, uh, but I'm being holiday right now. Uh, oh, now that's shade. <laughs> I love holiday. We go back a ways. So, but at any rate, I, I needed to make these points, but I want to get to also the, uh, to bring up the Trans People of Color Coalition. I feel like these things need to be said, particularly to a black audience, which I don't always get to address, uh, because we need to do the work within our communities to stop the madness. That being said, I work at the National Gay and Lesbian uh, Task Force. And I feel like they have been leaders on transgender issues for many years and still do because they put the T out there. We do put the T out there. And that's why I feel I'm there to put the T out there. Uh, I happen to be the first person that, trans, uh, that testified before the U.S. Senate on the Employment Non-Discrimination Act. And I will say this for our Senate for the first time after beating them for years and having worked on that bill for decades now, which also helps you tell my age, it's a little sore spot with me, uh, laughter, uh, is that um, our Senate called me to do that testimony and that speaks volumes for that we've moved. Uh, and I wanna share that with you. Uh, but we're still not there, obviously, and we still have a lot of work, and I want to make that push with you as well, is that we have to push our House members and Senator, our, our House uh, 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 Boehner, uh, to move the House, because he is blocking uh, the movement of the House to vote on this important piece of legislation while we have one, the one and only president would, that would sign that piece of legislation that gives us employment protection as trans people, that allows us to get off the streets, that allows us to be employed, uh, and that's just the first step, by the way, as we're pushing that big boulder up the hill. So I need you to do that, and I'm asking you to do that, to contact your House members and to, to uh, push them to get Senator Boehner to call the bill before the House to call a House vote on the Employment Non-Discrimination Act uh, so that transgender people, as well as gay people, have protections. But gay people are decades ahead of trans people, and let's put that on the table and be real about that as well as people write many op-eds about what about gay people. So I'll stop preaching even though uh, you know, I'm not a man of the cloth either, uh, uh, to quote uh, Julian Bond last night. But this is something that I do care about a lot. So my organization is one of the few organizations that puts the T out there every single day and that makes it a priority and that it's my priority every waking moment of my life. I'm a read, I'm a read, I'm a read. <laughs> the library is open. <laughs> I concur with everything that um, Kylar just said. Um, and I'd like to add that um, some trans people are invisible by choice. Hmm. And it's understandable that there are those of us whom choose to um, fly below the radar because a lot of times in your family, in the workplace, once it's determined that you're transgender, you're either harassed or you're fired from your job. So I understand those that choose to um, remain invisible by choice. Personally, um, my motto is to stand up for equality, show up and, and participate for equality. Because um, I personally feel that if I can't use my voice to um, discuss the need for 
employment non-discrimination um, for transgender people and hate crimes protections enforced locally, then I'm not doing what I was sent here to do. I feel like I was born to be transgender. I feel like I am here to make a difference for the youth that are coming up. Fortunately, um, being born and raised in South Carolina, I have a family that loves me and accepts me. Um, my mother calls me her daughter. I've been with my spouse for almost two decades now. This April 25th will be 18 years. So I have no choice but to show up and participate and be visible, to speak out for those that are being discriminated against and being treated less than human. So um, for those who are on the battlefield, I applaud you. And for those that are not, I understand. And um, hopefully one day, we would not have to continue to fight this fight. Transgender people will be treated like human beings as all human beings and we will receive um, human rights, civil rights protections so that we're not being killed and murdered on, a, on an annual basis. Um, my organization um, facilitates Transgender Day of Remembrance, TDOR, which is an annual um, event held to memorialize trans people that have been murdered or committed suicide due to their um, issues around their gender identity. And it's unfortunate that every year the lists get longer and longer and longer. And um, I'm at the point where it's very emotional for me to continue to read those lists and it seems like our elected officials don't care. However, I am so happy that we have the first sitting president in my history that has even said the word transgender. So I'm encouraged that things will get better. We just have to continue to hold on and continue to be visible and continue to fight for justice and equality. Um, so on the notion of the T being invisible in LGB spaces, um, so the, what happens is that I think that as, as people are, are growing up and they're coming of age and they are identifying with a particular gender and they realize they like other people the same gender and they overcome that particular um, internalized homophobia enough to maybe come out and uh, start dating people of their same gender. That's beautiful, but what happens is that messages around heteronormativity are still happening, have happened since birth, and so internalized heteronormativity is still at work even when folks come out as lesbian or as gay. And so what that looks like is transphobia within LGB spaces, and that looks politically, it looks like um, focusing mostly and only on sexual orientation initiatives like marriage equality. Um, it looks like cutting out uh, gender identity and uh, non-discrimination policies. And then interpersonally, it looks like scapegoating trans people. So, you know, um, for, for trans masculine people and trans male, it looks like butch women and uh, um, masculine lesbians saying like, yes, I'm masculine, but I'm not this, right? I've heard, we've heard this in many spaces. There's the Michigan Women's Music Festival uh, controversy. There's a Rivers of Honey, Honey in New York uh, controversy. On the trans um, feminine side, trans women side, it looks like gay men and gay, I mean, there's a split right there. We can even start with about masculinity among gay men spaces and how more masculine gay men are privileged way more than feminine gay men. You can read about this, you can go on Grindr or, uh, and, and read, you know, no, no femmes, what have you, right? Um, and then you break that down even further, uh, how, uh, even femme gay men can scapegoat trans women and say, well, yes, I'm feminine, but I'm still a man and I'm not that, right? So it, it works on an interpersonal uh, micro level all the way up to our macro policies. Um, and so um, what, one of the things that uh, Lambda Legal, the organization that I work for, is, uh, does about that besides, uh, we're primar primarily a legal organization, hence the name, but the department that I run is the community education department, so we're the folks that are activists, we're on the ground, we are um, changing the hearts and minds while our cohort attorneys are, are changing the policies and laws, um, is that we are part of a lot of coalitions, the trans people of color coalitions, and then also want to mention a local coalition, the Solutions Not Punishment Coalition called SNAPCO. 
Now what you have up the street in Midtown Atlanta is this really interesting intersection of people. Midtown Atlanta is considered to be the neighborhood. Um, it also is a source of a lot of businesses. It's also the site of the largest uh, homeless shelter in Atlanta. It houses 500 beds. Um, and so what happens on, on Peachtree, I know there's a lot of peach trees in Atlanta, the Peachtree <laughs> Street, as opposed to Peachtree Road or Peachtree Avenue, is um, you see uh, gay folks, you know, cisgender gay folks, a lot of men, um, you see business folks, and then you see a lot of trans women who actually have to disrobe their femininity to go into that large shelter because mm. they, it's a men's shelter, so they have to take off their hair and nails and what have you and, and go by their uh, legal name. That's a whole nother story. Um, and, and what you see are these um, policies like aggregate, aggravated prostitution is the latest one that we've gotten where people within who live in the Midtown area, many of which are uh, gay men, are accusing the, the girls on the street who are doing survival sex work of being uh, predators, of being in street, uh, gangs of prostitution is the language, right? And so um, what we're doing is, we, well we fought that policy so that it was a, there was a banishment ordinance. Um, uh, yes, banishment, not, this is not the Old Testament, it's actually 2014, um, where they were trying to, uh, uh, if, you were, if you were arrested for, assumed to be soliciting, soliciting for sex work or actually doing it, um, that you would not be able to come back to that area in a whole uh, catchment area around there. And so we, SNAPCO, Solutions Not Punishment Coalition, successfully um, got that off the books, but now what we're doing is um, actually doing sustainable solutions with um, trans women on the street who are uh, around jobs and around healthcare. And, um, and it's interesting that some of our biggest um, sort of agitators in that is are gay people. So um, that is an extreme form of internalized heteronormativity. Um, and I think that uh, the only other thing I wanted to say about that is, um, so, so, you know, if you wanna go home as a cis person and, and say like, you know, what can I, how can I be a better ally? Um, a large thing and then a tiny thing. A large thing is to every time you are um, fighting against discrimination around sexual orientation, be that an actual like campaign rally or just you know speaking up to your auntie who keeps forgetting that you're gay, um, is also remembering as you're doing this, remembering the three fingers that are that are coming back to you and remembering that it's uh, it, it's greater just than just you know who you like, but for a lot of us it's also who we are. Um, and then finally, five beautiful words. Get people's freaking pronouns right. This is so. Uh, it's so simple and then yet so difficult, apparently. That is sort of like the first line of uh, safety for trans people is if someone were, that we're talking to and that we, we know or we care about, if, if they can address us and how we say we feel. Um, then we can, then that's, that opens the door to like, actually I can tell you more about my life. Actually, um, I can support your uh, efforts and you can support mine. And of course there's sort of like a, a cognitive uh, rearrangement that needs to happen. I make mistakes, we all make mistakes. So if you make a mistake, admit that you made a mistake. Don't just act like it didn't happen and like, oh, you know, whoa, huh? Did you hear what Carlton? You know, um, and I actually had to write up a list of like what to do if you mispronounce someone. Um, for, for colleagues um, at, at my organization, which is an or LGBT organization. Um, if you need to think of it as um, the way you think of someone's name changing when they get married, or they have a spiritual excursion, like Snoop, Snoop Lion, you know, call the man Snoop Lion, you know, expect, respect his identity. Um, I kid, but you know, it, the, I think the argument is like, oh, I didn't mean anything. When people say like, oh, I didn't mean anything by it, then I say, well, maybe you should put more meaning into what you say. Um, and, well. and um, yeah, simple, but, um, but definitely, definitely something that I, I think everyone could, could do by the end of this conference, actually. So I have a very short piece to say about the first part of the question. I just think as a community, we became very comfortable with a marginal win. When it came to NDEV, we thought that we could just slice off that T, and if we could get the votes and move it down the field, that would actually be considered a win. 
We didn't take con into consideration what it would look like, how it would feel when we left some of our comrades on the field. And, and quite frankly, it hurts now that, we, now that we're honest about the conversations and the discussions and the deliberations that took place and still take place, quite frankly, when we think about how far we could get if we just quit trying to include our trans brothers and sisters. Um, that marginal win is not, it's not a real win uh, in my mind and shouldn't be in any of our, in our focus space. Uh, it kind of conjures up this idea of when only white men uh, could, could vote, quite frankly. And, and when African-American men uh, gained the right to vote, was the fight over? No, not at all. Because Susan B. Anthony and others understood that women also appreciated and deserved that same right. Um, and we, had, we have history to show us that it's very easy sometimes for us to settle in this marginal win column. We could very easily celebrate the, the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and simply pat ourselves on the back. But then we'd be missing the, the reform and the necessary strides that need to take place in the immigration space in this country. And we talk about today trans people of color, but there are a lot of folks who are still silently uh, suffering. Uh, and so I think if nothing else, this whole concept of a marginal win being satisfactory has to die in our, in our conversation piece. The second part uh, about how our, how our specific organizations or departments are engaging um, with the T in LGBT specifically, um, something that really set the entire foundation and purpose behind uh, uh, my boss, Dr. Leonard, wanting to be a part of this conversation was the work the USDA is currently doing. Uh, we currently, and I believe we're, we are actually in the final uh, comment period of revising our non-discrimination uh, regulations so that it now specifically covers gender identity and expression as a protected basis. This is something that, quite frankly, is only covered other than uh, USDA by HUD. Uh, it's a huge stride, and need, of course more needs to be done. But the important part is that we're now uh, working with the Department of Justice, we're working with NCTE, other LGBT organizations as well, actually very close, we have meetings with MBJC as well, to ensure that we are preparing the right training module for our 106,000 USDA employees. The reason why I only have two hours here today is because I've been flying around the country engaging with our policy shop and we are training our USDA employees. We're talking about what trend gender identity is, what gender expression is, and we're not leaning on our own understanding of what LGBT terminology is, but rather we're reaching out to those in the space, those on the field that know a heck of a lot more than we do about what it means to not only provide us government service, but to provide it with the best customer service possible. I'm not here to tell you and toot our own horn and say we're perfect, but I am saying that we're right. We're in a perfect space to good, do good work, and we cannot waste the time we have because we don't know what the next couple of years hold for us. Uh, it is imperative that we all work, whether it's outside the government space or inside, to effectuate some kind of change to a space where no matter who comes in next, red, green, blue, that they would be embarrassed to roll back the progress that we make. Um, and, and so uh, I think that, and I get back to this T is silence, something else we're doing this summer that I don't want to forget to say, we're doing an LGBT rules summit and it's going to have at least three stops. We're starting June 6th in Greensboro, North Carolina. Uh, and, okay, I expect to see this whole table. Uh, and, and we'll have more information. We'll make sure if, if, if the uh, conference coordinators would uh, send out our blast, we're happy to send you. But we're gonna work very closely with uh, you know North Carolina A&T and all the colleges and universities. But the whole day is not just about the government talking at the LGBT community, but we're actually gonna switch roles on the second half of the day and listen. Uh, and we're gonna have our government officials, our policymakers in the audience to listen and figure out what we need to find our focus as we have this, these last couple of years of precious time, not knowing what comes next. So um, be on the lookout for that, but we certainly have more work to do and we, we, we certainly wanna do it with your help. Mm -hmm. I want to pick up on uh, something that um, Holiday mentioned uh, with regard to a focus on marriage equality. And, you know, it seems for the last decade at least, um, it's been longer, but it intensified, particularly at the, uh, in the early 2000s, this focus on marriage equality, especially uh, among the, the, the big organ organizations like Human Rights Campaign and Lambda Legal, for instance. 
Much to the chagrin, I might add, uh, to some black queer organizations um, who believe that things like employment discrimination were more priority uh, in uh, queer communities of color. What are your thoughts about uh, this focus on marriage equality, especially now that uh, DOMA has been overturned and more states have legalized um, same-sex marriage? And again, from, from some of my uh, transgender friends and colleagues, they actually have issue with the term same sex because they feel that it's transphobic. Um, what now uh, relative to issues pertaining to the trans community um, now that DOMA has passed, uh, has been, I'm sorry, overturned uh, and we've had this focus on marriage equality what now, from each of your perspectives, should we be focusing on? And what did you feel about the focus on marriage equality? Anybody can start. We don't have to start with um, Skylar. I feel that um, marriage equality is very, very important. However, I also believe that um, employment protections are even more important because if you don't have a job, <laughs> I mean, you're going to get married and you're going to be broke and you can't live on your own, you can't buy food, you can't pay your bills, you can't buy gas. So I think some of these mainstream organizations have their own personal agendas, which is okay. However, I consider myself as grassroots, so I personally think that um, employment protections and, and people getting jobs um, is very important, and then we'll deal with the marriage equality later, you know, once we can work and support ourselves. <laughs> um, uh, my comments about this are super brief, um, which is that, I mean, the marriage equality train has left the station. It's, we're not gonna shift funds to, to more grassroots um, initiatives. We know what those are. We know, you know, em from employment to healthcare fairness, um, housing, education, there's a whole list that, that we know impact us more, but what's, uh, I don't think what is effective is um, arguing with these funders and with these uh, mm -hmm. larger orgs to say, you know, what about us, what about our needs? It's, it's left the, the station, um, right? So what I think uh, could happen is that continue to put efforts and money into those uh, other initiatives that we know are um, as perhaps definitely more um, uh, immediate. Um, and uh, having now been behind some of the scenes of a few um, statewide marriage equality cases um, and knowing just exactly uh, what type of couples are representing these cases to win these states, um, it cuts out a lot of people. Um, and um, just to be you know, very transparent, um, most of the couples in these cases that are winning for these states are you, there's a, actually a strong rubric. You have to have been together for a number of years, like 10 plus years is preferred, five plus is definite. Uh, you have to be, uh, you cannot, not, neither partner can be bisexual and certainly not pansexual. Um, you cannot be polyamorous. Um, and so, and, and it's helpful if you have some, a little income and some, you know, public speaking skills because you're gonna be in the media a lot. So think mm -hmm. about all those things. Think about yourself, think about your community. Um, no bath houses, no play parties, okay? Um, and, um, and, and this is who is, these are the, the folks that are leading, are the main people in these movements. Now, the reason why I'm bringing that up is not to say like, well, you know, F marriage. Okay, now I'm really more mad at marriage, right? That's not my point. My point is, if these are the folks that uh, get these rights, then once we have the rights, any of us can get married. So then if I want to marry Jillian, my best friend and family member, then we could do that and get our finances together because, you know, um, Jane and Janie did it first, right? So what I'm saying is let's not, like, spend too much energy. I thought I was going to be brief. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> let's not spend too much energy. Like, um, come on, guys. What about housing? Like, take our energy and put it into the programs that work on housing and employment, et cetera. And once the main stream gets marriage and we can all we can freak it you know marry your friend whatever um, so I think holiday I, I think I, I felt your spirit I think I know what you're saying 
about the fact that when everyone was pumping up marriage, as someone who um, I consider myself pretty darn young and everybody says I look like a baby, uh, and I, thank you. Uh, and quite frankly, I've just now matured to where I can talk about marriage without itching and, and getting uncomfortable. Uh, that wasn't my prime uh, letter of importance. It just wasn't as important. I'll tell you what was important to me in my mind was fair credit uh, and, and the idea of safe schools uh, because school was still, and still, quite frankly, is not that far away from me. I remember what it was like for folks who may not have been as, uh, as big and boisterous as I am in a space for them who were, you know, are LGBT to walk the halls and feel like they just quite frankly didn't, didn't know who was gonna pick on them that day. That's what I feel like takes a back seat and somehow, some way, we forgot how to juggle. We thought that in order to get in front of the, t the television, uh, television cameras, in order to get that byline, we had to keep talking about one thing and I understand uh, that that's a, a strategic tactic, but in the same mindset when we have conferences like that, we simply can't have eight panels talking about marriage. Because a lot of us, number one, shouldn't get married. <laughs> uh, um, that, know thyself, exactly. Uh, and we're doing society a favor by not getting married. So. Uh, I, I don't know if the Lord taps me as that kind of person, but I do know that uh, I, I'm not going to become uh, monotone in this space. We have to be able to juggle. Uh, because what if they get tired of hearing the marriage thing? Or when they say, we gave you marriage, they go sit down and be quiet. Um, are we really going to be quiet? Or are we going to have something that we're already juggling? Say, no, no, no. Remember we were talking about this discrimination as far as employment and housing is concerned. And let me remind you about hate crimes. We have more work than we can certainly do. So um, I understand. I don't knock the idea of marriage because, quite frankly, before uh, Ms. Parks got on that bus, a lot of folks didn't understand the importance of the Civil Rights Act. Someone had to set some type of agenda and tone. Uh, and if marriage is our agenda and tone, that's fine. But not all of us need to run to that uh, that altar. And some of you gonna have to run to Kyler and get him to file your papers uh, for divorce too. Uh, so, so certainly we can juggle more. I'm all about the truth, Miss Tracy. Um, I'm all about the truth. So, well, you know, my take on it is my, I share all the sentiment of my colleagues. But marriage was a wedge issue spun by the Republican Party in an election year. And that's simply what it was. And the big gay movement bought it by, by, and chomped on it and ran with it. It was during the uh, mid-2000s, and it was during the election year. And the Republican Party said, gee, what can we do to spin our base? And it was, if we bring out the big pink elephant, which is gay marriage, then we can mobilize our base and disenfranchise uh, the, uh, the Democrats and win the election. And what happened was it didn't work necessarily for the Republicans, and we got some good court rulings actually in our favor. And then, uh, and I don't like to use the word gay ink because that just fractionalizes the community because there is really no gay ink, by the way. I hate to put a pen in that bubble as well. But there is no gay ink. Uh, so even though we like to read about it. So then uh, the bigger orgs did jump on that uh, because of who the funding bases are in those groups. Granted, there are a lot of corporations, but we know the bigger, do uh, their main funding base comes from not us. Okay, we don't send those monthly checks in. Okay, another reality. Okay, we have to get on board with organizations like National Black Justice Coalition, which, by the way, I'm also a board member of that too, by the way. I don't sleep. Um, because that's a very important organization because we have to make our dollars count, our votes count, and until we get real and form our own organizations and speak for ourselves and do our own work for ourselves, we can't count on other people to do it for us, folks. Let's wake up and smell that coffee. So, um, and then we can spread out the issues and then we can make a voice and then we can say what the issues are and then we can help decide uh, what the array of issues are as to how they're parsed out. Otherwise, we're letting people make those decisions for us. And that's the simple fact of how I see it. So 
larger groups do, and, and, and Holiday is right of how the litigants are chosen, because when you're deciding to choose a winning case, it's like picking a winning football team or basketball team. You're going to look at it and you're going to strategize. I mean, that's what it comes down to, as cold and calculated as that may seem. Now, be that as it may, uh, marriage brings some people economic security, blah, 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 blah. There are other issues that are more important to me. Unlike Tracy, it seems basic to me that if you don't have a job, you know, I'm from the old school of practicality. You can't do anything without a job. You know, I come from a working class background, a working class family. I've had a job, believe it or not, since I was five years old. That's how you got your money to spend. And I've had a job since I was five. Um, and I've always had a job and I've always had more than one job. Um, even until today. So um, working is very important to me, and I think working is very important to working class people. So I think jobs, econom uh, e which is economic security, school safety, street safety, all the issues that are important to us don't rise to the top until we make them important issues. And somehow in our own cultures, we have became sort of lazy. I don't like that word. Let me take that away because that's what people used against us and, and have used against me because, you know, I was black, lazy, shiftless, and all those things as a racist term. So I take that back. Thank you, Tracy. Take that back. But um, somehow we became comfortable. That's a better word. Uh, Post-civil rights era. We became comfortable because it's sort of like when a group attains rights, as we see the mainstream larger gay movement has become comfortable when we get a few rights, we sort of forget that we didn't have rights yesterday. So we, then we become comfortable and we don't do a lot because our parents, because you can tell I'm a little aged and I'm the post-civil rights era, I'm actually a civil rights era baby. And so I was with my parents when they were fighting in the civil rights movement. So it's not that far distant from me of separate but equal because I was there when the water fountains were separate but equal. So it's important for me to continue that fight and somewhere we've lost that kind of fight because we got complacent and comfortable with other people doing fighting for us. Because generational shift has occurred because those people are dead and old. I'm done. I want to um, shift gears just a little bit and ask a question um, about popular culture as it relates to policy. Um, I'd say for the last 15 years now, um, white queers in, in mainstream uh, popular culture have, have become commonplace since Ellen's coming out story, Will and Grace, and so on and so forth. But recently we've had a number of uh, black transgender folk emerge in popular culture, um, specifically Laverne Cox um, and uh, Janet Mock uh, and the model Inez Rao, just to name a few. Um, while we know that transgender, I think Kalara even said this early, we know that transgender and gender variant folks have been a part of our community f since we've been on this soil. Uh, right now, we're seeing them become a part of popular culture. Um, how do you account for this um, emergence of representation? Do you believe it's a fetishization of, of these uh, um, folk, or is it an acknowledgement that they are a part, that you all are a part of our community? And do you feel that the presence now in popular culture of black trans and gender variant folk hinders or helps policy decision-making processes? Could you clarify our community for me, please? I'm a lawyer, just trying to clarify <laughs> what our community means. Um, both. Mainstream community? No. LGBT community. Yes, LGBT, but also within that black LGBT. Do you see you mean like Laverne and, and uh, Janet are part of this greater community? Correct. Or is it a fetish, fetishization? Correct. Okay. 
I personally feel that um, Janet and Laverne, um, get yours. I mean, if the opportunities are there, get yours. Um, on the other hand, I just hope that um, those representations are positive ones. I am so sick and tired of Jerry Springer, my tranny wedding and all this other mess. So as long as the, the representations are positive and presenting us um, as diverse people that we are, then, you know, go ahead and get yours. Um, yeah, absolutely. I was going to say, um, right, that trans folks have actually kind of been in the media for a long time, uh, maybe even longer than uh, LGB people, um, but not in the best ways, as you mentioned. Um, and so this is sort of the first time that we're seeing, um, beyond just even like a neutral light, but definitely a positive light of, um, of, of telling our stories and um, from our own voices, and certainly Orange is the New Black was not our own voice, um, but I think that the way they portrayed uh, Laverne Cox's character um, opened up the doors and eyes of a lot of folks in terms of what it looks like to, um, to be in the criminal justice system for trans people and to, and to you know, survive. Um, and then of course she's now made a documentary about C.C. McDonald, which is furthering people's uh, kitchen table conversations. Um, the beautiful thing about these women in particular being in the mainstream and almost becoming household names, which I think is remarkable, is that it's highlighting this amazing thing that happens even within trans communities. Um, and, excuse me, by amazing I mean messed up thing, um, which is trans misogyny. Um, and so, you know, people, masculinity is like cake, like everyone freaking loves it, right? And, um, and I identify as masculine, so it's, it's actually a lot of work that, um, I, it's a lot of things that I think about and work on, which is um, redefining masculinity and, um, and learning what parts of masculinity are birthed from femininity. And so there is a particular um, set of uh, dangers and targets that trans women and trans feminine people in general undergo that trans masculine people do not. Um, and I think that these women's stories in the mainstream are highlighting that and even having that word in mainstream media, thank you Melissa Harris Perry for saying trans misogyny on primetime TV. Um, and um, it, which, you know, trickles out to again, I'm, I'm from the camp of like trans people not just being like, hey guys, we're equal. We're actually sort of like, we were here to teach, we're here to teach y'all. And that's not, I'm not saying that from like a, a hierarchical perspective, but just that there's a unique experience in transgressing gender and living part of your life as this one world and then another, from going from the salon to the barbershop. Um, it, it's, it's a remarkable thing. I'd love to tell you about it over coffee. Um, but that if you have that experience, if you're blessed to have that experience, um, if you're blessed to be trans, um, it, it, it doesn't look the same for all trans people. Tracy's experience and my experience are so different. And I actually uh, walk with a lot of privileges um, because I'm masculine, because people expect me to know what I'm talking about, because they bring me that bill um, at, the, at the dinner table, et cetera, et cetera. And so what Laverne and Janet are doing is saying like, not only like, hey, trans people exist, but like within that, there's, um, there's, a, there's a, we can expand the conversation around sexism. We can expand the conversation around masculinity. And so, um, so I big up them for that. And then the last thing I want to say about that is what I fear though is the Oprah syndrome, which is like, you know, oh, well they made it. Oh, they're, they're passable and beautiful, right? Y'all know what quote unquote passing is, um, I, right? Okay. Um, and so I just, I, I fear that we will get so caught up in their stories that we forget about um, the woman down on Peachtree um, that I was talking about. Um, so yeah, let's not, let's make sure that doesn't happen. Um, I think that, um, uh, I agree, I think that we have been in the discourse for a long time, portrayed in very negative ways. Uh, I just analogize this to going to the movie theater when I was growing up and we would always count in the scenes as to when the black character would die. Mm -hmm. We'd go, okay, the dog died. Uh, okay, now the black character died. Now the movie begins. Okay, and there are only a few of you will understand that in here uh, of my generation uh, but it would happen like in the first two minutes of the movie and then boom the movie would start 
and that would always be the formula of the movie uh, until the black exploitation of the early 1970s. And like that was better, right? Uh, but I digress. Uh, so I think that what's happened, and even though as Holiday pointed out that uh, Orange is the New Black is not uh, Laverne's platform, is that these women are genius, is that they spun their own platforms because that's what we do as black people. We know how to make it happen. Uh, and as people of color. And so they've been genius and smart to know how to craft things to make it happen for them in a positive light. And, and I applaud them uh, for doing that and to spin it because our characters even, you know, you can go back to Candace Kane and, and some of the white characters that have had leads in major TV shows and what have you. And they've never quite cut out of that negative role on TV, but Laverne and, uh, and, and Janet have, and, uh, and I'm not actually familiar with the models because I guess I just am not in the model world yet So because my head's too busy somewhere else. Uh, but I'll go check them out and see. <laughs> uh, but what I do fear also is what uh, Holiday said is the, the Oprah syndrome and that we fit, forget the real everyday people who aren't, aren't are just everyday people trying to live everyday lives, which is what you know, I fight for and my battle is about every day. And then I, I also worry about one other thing, the converse of that, because we never see the, the masculine of center people in the mainstream. Uh, we never do that, you know, Chaz Bono kinda, sorta, uh, you know, but we never see any masculine of center people and uh, there's gonna be an explosion of that, I do hope, one day. Uh, it's always the converse of that, which is the, the feminine of center who have transitioned, and that's a discourse that needs to begin in this country. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.